Okay, so I think we are on now. All right. Um, let's see. Let's see if we're gonna. I am gonna see someone joining. Uh, da, da, da. I don't have any counter on the YouTube side. Mm -hmm. So if any, anyone's there, there. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, uh, if there's anyone, anyone on the on the chat, please let us know. Uh, I see people maybe coming in here uh, from the other side. I see three people, but if you can ping anything on the chat, yeah, great, great. I see the first messages, so perfect. We can start. Awesome. Uh, right. So once once again, hello and welcome to the second uh, second workshop on how to program smart contracts. I'm Adam. I will be your today's host. And my guest is Xing Wei, uh, founder of Script and CEO as well. Um, you can introduce yourself as well. Hey, uh, everyone. It's, uh, it's my great pleasure to be invited to speak at the Polish uh, Blockchain Association workshop and uh, to show you guys how to you know, program smart contracts on Bitcoin, and namely uh, Bitcoin SV blockchain. So ask a little bit about me. So I've been into the crypto space since uh, 2017. And uh, prior to that, I work at uh, Facebook as a research scientist. And so I've, I've been, you know, trying a different uh, blockchains as everybody can probably else there as well. You know, when I first uh, got in, you know, crypto full time, I, you know, I was doing uh, Solidity, Ethereum, and then I went to years doing uh, C++ and then later on I just find out you know neither of these work for me and all the seems to be the latest blockchains that's popping up every once once in a while and that's why I dub into the so-called Bitcoin protocol which uh, you know today is the most unbounded version of working on the Bitcoin SV blockchain so uh, the problem is there's no you know, developer tools is uh, pretty much you have to write in machine code. So that's why I create an S script. So it's a, you can think of a full stack uh, developer platform. So we offer, you know, smart counter high level languages, also all the API SDKs, everything you can think of to help facilitate, you know, writing smart counter as easy as a web two develop development. Yes. Perfect. Thank you for your introduction. Uh, we're going to try to have this uh, as interactive as possible. So if you have any That'd questions, you can post them uh, anytime on, on the chat so I can put them on, on the screen so everyone everyone is going to see it. We can, we can respond to that. Um, we're going to have a Q&A session at the end. But of course, you can you can post the questions any anytime. Um, yeah, this is our second second part, let's say maybe not part, but second edition of, of, of this workshop. Um, and the first on our brand new YouTube. So if you're interested on uh, similar content, you can just subscribe. So because we're gonna have like another one in maybe one month. Uh, so we're gonna have other, uh, other guests here with us. Uh, there will be a recording of this. So I think we, we're going to keep this uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, but if you but if you if it's not listed, uh, you can ping me on on LinkedIn. So we can uh, just share with you the, the link if it's not uh, on the public state. Uh, said that. Um, Grab a cup of coffee and All right. let's jump in. All right, let me share my screen and uh, let's get started. All right. Can you see it? Uh, 
give a sec. Yeah, now it should be should be on our stream. Okay. Is it now it's on, right? Right, yeah. Okay. All right, let's uh dive into it. So as I just uh you know in the introduction, I briefly talk about you know what we do here again. We are a smart counter full stack uh solution on Bitcoin specifically on Bitcoin SV blockchain. So you know, even going to, before we even dive into the technical detail, I just want to say, you know, where does the, you know, S group come from? It all goes back to the history of, you know, Bitcoin, you know, from no other than, none other than the creator, the Satoshi Nakamoto himself. So basically when he first released Bitcoin, you know, it's not only for sending payment from Alice's Bitcoin address to Bob's Bitcoin address. He also put this, you can think about like a virtual machine and with a full suite, you know, fully featured uh, instruction set, which called, uh, you know, it's kind of like opcode and also called Bitcoin script. So he said, you know, he doesn't want to be just specifically from sending one address to another. He wants to have different types of transactions, you know, including bounded transactions, escrow or third party or even multi seek so that you know, if there's a future, you know, scenarios, big people use Bitcoin for, you know, more complicated uh, logic. So it, it, uh, he's, he wants to make sure it can be covered later. Okay. So that's where it comes from, the Bitcoin the opcode instruction set. So it's not just for, you know, address to address, because otherwise there will be, he doesn't have to put the so-called opcode or in Bitcoin script in Bitcoin since, 0.1 version, okay? And another high level, you know, want to just get it out of the way is to say, hey, you know, I heard about a lot of other smart contract platforms such as Ethereum, you know, Tron, Solana, and maybe today you got uh, even Aptos, what's the, the, whatever the latest fad is. So why do we want to do smart contract on Bitcoin SV? Because there are quite a few, you know, very good features that if you want to build any kind of a smart counter based applications, for example, the, you know, the foremost, I would say is scalable today. It's not scalable 18 months from now, and you can actually do it uh, on the mainnet. So we have uh, tested stress tested, and it can support up to you know, 3000 transactions per second today. And uh, versus Ethereum, you know, a lot of people are working on, is a mirror 15 versus B BTC is about uh, six, right? So that's a huge benefit. If you want to develop any kind of a, you know, apps that's require a lot of transactions. So as a, almost as a corollary, as a side effect of the scalability is cost. The cost is extremely low. So many times it's going to be, you know, a fraction of a fraction of a US cents, okay? And we can achieve this at the same time with the same type of transactions, right? It's not because it's, nobody is using, so it's very cheap. Actually, uh, we, we have some uh, record of uh, pumping, I think it's 50 million transactions a daily, but the fees is still as low as like a fraction of a cent. Versus Ethereum, you can easily see it's usually it's tens of dollars. So it's much, it's uh, four orders or sometimes five orders uh, more the cheaper okay the whole reason is because you know fundamentally it's using the uh, Bitcoin uses the model so-called horizontal scaling so if you think about you know zoom or it, Google Facebook Twitter whatever internet service you are today so you're using this model to scale basically you add more resources more machines it's going to process more requests okay versus ethereum and many other so-called account based uh, blockchains is using vertical scaling, meaning you buy bigger and bigger machines. But you know, machines, it doesn't matter how much money you get. At the end of the day, it's it's get an upper bound, right? How much, how big the machine it is. And using this model, not only we can reach th uh, three thousand on testnet, we have seen one hundred thousand transactions per second. And there is, as you can see, there's no bound, right? So that's the biggest difference with you know, why we want to program a smart contract on BSV. 
Okay. So if you have any questions, just uh, please submit and uh, I will try to address it then. Okay. So Bitcoin smart contract, if you are coming from a account or EVM kind of world, is is uh, quite different from uh, you know so those kind of uh, smart contract platform. So fundamentally, it's called the UTXO model. UTXO stands for unspent transaction output. So when we say bitcoins, hey, you have some bitcoin, I have some bitcoin. It's not we have a account that's associated with our address. It's actually you can think of, you know, you have transactions. Transaction have, you know, that for example here. You have inputs, you have outputs. So all your Bitcoins are actually scattered around in different, uh, you know, maybe different uh, outputs. So for example, you know, here I may have uh, two Bitcoins and then think about the contract is a lock, okay? It's a spending condition. So only when you try to spend it, this is the input, you have to say, hey, you have to specify, I'm spending from this UTXO and you want to give it a secret key, a key. You know, if this key matches this lock, and then basically in a more mathematical form, so this lock you can think of is a function. It's almost equivalent to a mathematical function. And this X is a arguments to this function or sometimes called wait list, right? So if you can make sure, you know, if this X when it's evaluated uh, to true upon, uh, after applying F, then you are legitimate, you, you can spend the, the coins here, okay? So this is the basic model, okay? But of course, in our two toolings, we make sure you don't have to know a lot of specific of this, okay? So the fundamental thing about this model is the function, the F here can be arbitrary, right? So in normal Bitcoin address, you can think about this, oh, you just check the signature, right? Make sure you have the private key that can generate the signature. But that's just one type, okay? So that's why we, we call it smart counter because it's a prog programmable. You can define arbitrary conditions, you know, for the redeemer to spend it, okay? So for us, we deviate a, a little bit from, uh, you know, let's say Solidity or Ethereum world because you know, when we design the Bitcoin smart contract, we want to follow a few principles. So the ultimate goal is to make sure the developer's experience is superb. It's as easy as you program a Bitcoin, uh, so-called web tool, you know, let's say websites or apps. So to that, for that to happen, we make a few choices. First, you don't have to learn some new programming language. Right? For example, if you want to go to you know, EVM compatible chains, usually you have to use some kind of new, you know, standalone smart contract programming language such as Solidity or Viper or some, you go to some other chain like Solana, you have to run, learn some, some kind of Rust, right? And the problem is not many people know about it. And the second thing is, you know, if you don't have, you can reuse some existing mainstream language, and then you can use all your favorite tools like IDEs or, or package managers. So all this to make it easier to program smart contract. So the reason, you know, the, the rationale behind the, all of this is, you know, as, you know, as uh, popular as Web3 is getting, but if you look at the big picture, which we compared against, you know, so-called Web2 developers, you know, that's the word, you know, people using Python or JavaScript you know, even uh, C++. So if you look at the, the total number of developers, it's still a small, small dot. We have about uh, a little bit less than 20,000. If you even look at the JavaScript, uh, that's about, that's close to like 20 million. So it's not in the same bulk bug. So that's why we end up designing a, a framework I call it S script that's uh, a TypeScript based framework to write smart contracts. Okay, so this is so-called, you know, using computer computer science uh, in a jargon, we call it the domain specific language, but it's embedded in TypeScript. So it is fully TypeScript. So people don't have to 
you know, learn something completely new, right? They can just, if they already know JavaScript or TypeScript, they can, this is just another library they can use. There's no new program language to learn, okay? That's just much easier for people to, to get aboard. So even if you can see from here, you know, if you have any kind of uh, object or edit uh, programming experience before, you can play, you can see, hey, this is, hey, you, this is the hello world here. I just want to see, show it very succinctly. This is a full contract. So this is the name of the contract is uh, hello world. So basically you have to extend this base class called the smart contract class. So the, you can add some prop properties. So the only different big difference is we use some kind of uh, an annotations right here. Right. So for a lot of people who may already be familiar with this, we can customize the, the behavior of different uh, fields or functions, you know, with this kind of uh, uh, annotations. One is prop, basically as the name suggests, is properties. And second is method. Basically it is uh, how you call, especially is the public, how do you call from transactions? How do you send transaction to to interact with the smart contract once it's been deployed on chain, okay? So you can see it has props, it has methods, and also in the methods, uh, you know, the most typical way to, you can specify the spending conditions is using asserts, assertions, right? For example, here, it's pretty readable. Basically, you give it a hash, and whoever wants to Spend it has to know the pre-image of the hash. Basically, hey, I give you this uh, this uh, hash number. If you know something X that can hash to this number, then you can you can move these coins. Okay. So that's uh, that's a model we are using, and that's uh, at the highest level. You know what the uh, uh, S script smart counter looks like. Okay. If you write it, uh, you can even, yeah, it's about 10 lines, okay? So for today, I, because it's, I want to make it high level, so I don't want to jump into all the details of the specific syntax and the libraries and functions. So for that, you can always go to our homepage, which I'm going to put in the show notes. You can always go to check it out later. So what I'm going to do is today, I'll show you high level, you know, the whole developer, development workflow, okay? So before I even dive into, you know, how to, I just show you how to write the kind of hello world in S script. So here today is another, here on the screen is another very popular, it's almost the, I think it's the most popular type of smart contract. Basically this is what a Bitcoin address is about, right? So for example, if you Alice sends Bob some, uh, let's say two Bitcoins and he, he sent to Bob so-called Bitcoin address. This is essentially what it does. It locks the two Bitcoins in this smart contract. So what this smart contract does is, you know, you have to provide uh, two things to spend it. One is the signature. This is the number one thing. The second is, what is the public key corresponding to this uh, address, okay? So first you have to make sure this public key, it actually matches the, the hash, which is, you can think about the Bitcoin address. The Bitcoin address is the hash of a public key, okay? So first it makes sure the hash matches, and then after that, it knows, hey, this public key is correct. So I'm going to, you know, check if the signature is correct too. So, you know, if you look at the block explorer, you know, look at the opcode, it's very difficult. It's almost impossible, for, especially for newcomers to understand. But then we, if we rewrite it, it, the equivalent, you know, high level language code is going to look something like this, okay? So I just showed you two examples, you know, how to write one, right? Should be simple enough. If you're already familiar with any kind of an object uh, oriented, uh, oriented programming, so once you have it, right, the, you know, the next step, right, if you are you're developing any kind of a uh, serious in production application, you want to test your framework, you want to test your contract, right? So the good thing about us is, you know, since it's just TypeScript, 
you can use all your favorite, you know, testing frameworks, right? For example, we will use Mocha and try here. You know, you can use a Jazz or, you know, whatever a favorite, you know, TypeScript or JavaScript testing framework, right? So it's also very readable. You know, if you have done any kind of JavaScript before and using similar frameworks, so you describe, you get a collection of test cases to cover all your use cases, right? So here, for our case, we mostly test, you should test two cases. One is, hey, if I give the correct parameters or arguments, it should pass, right? And also you want to cover the opposite. And what if I give you the wrong argument? You should not pass, right? So you can see, you know, this is the exact syntax. And uh, this is how you, you make the assertions here. If it's not correct, and if it's correct, you can put different expectation of it. Okay. So the bottom line is, it's just TypeScript and JavaScript. So you can just use all your favorite, you know, testing frameworks or even IDEs to, to test it. Okay. So once you test it, you may want to try it out. And uh, we provide a lot of tools and SDKs. So, so for example, if you want to deploy it in code, so this is, you know, about, I think a little bit about 10 lines or even less. We did, we deployed the hello world example. So you can say, hey, at first I initialize it, you know, I use new, of course, because it's just a class. And then I get a few, I connect to a signer. This one is, if you're already using, you know, Ethereum tools, you're probably familiar with Web3 Jazz or Ethers Jazz. So it's a similar concept, the wallet. It has been abstracted into so-called signer. So you connect it. And once you connect it, you just one line. You say, hey, hello world dot deploy. That's it. With one line, you can deploy your contract. And then you want to uh, interact with it by calling its public methods. You can just call dot the name of the con, the name of the public function you're calling and then give it a parameters. And this is how you can call it. Also, uh, I think within one long line, if you want to put this all together. So pretty much it's as simple as you can get. With one line, you can deploy it, and then with one line, you can call it, okay? So yeah, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask in the chat box anytime, okay? So we just covered, you know, the how do you test it and how you deploy it and uh, call it, okay? Hopefully it's as simple as it, you can think of, okay? So uh, another big category, you know, I would say the- Maybe one more from, from my side. Okay, uh, do, go do ahead. You have an, do you have any test net? So, you know, like yes. in Ethereum, you have several test nets that you can like deploy your contract, spend, fake Ethereum and, you know, test it yourself. Yes, great yeah. question. Okay. Of course we have a, we have a test net. It's, it's just called test net versus the so-called main net. So even here, it's also very easy. If you have a signer, you can even configure it. Hey, connect to the test net because when you're first writing about, writing a contract for the first draft, you're probably not getting it correct, right? So the standard workflow is first connect to the, to the test net and make sure everything works and then once you pass that, then you can start uh, playing it on the mainnet. But the short answer, yes, definitely we have a test net, but also we have a, a lot of faucet. So for example, from our website, if you go to sgrip.io, so we also run a faucet. You can also collect some free test coins when you are playing with all, any kind of our examples. You can get the test, test coin there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Perfect. Great question. So when we are talking about testnet, speaking of testnet, and uh, you know our contract not working for the first time, we write it. We often, uh, almost always, I would say always, yeah, at least for me, I don't know about you, but <laughs> maybe you write the contract and it just works. For me, a lot of time I'm spending on debugging, okay? So this is, I think, uh, one of my favorite features about S script. It's super easy to debug because it's just TypeScript, okay? So it's, uh, 
it's very different from Solidity, right? Debugging any kind of like a sophisticated error or bugs in Solidity, especially during uh, at mainnet, is is a pain. I've tried it many times, so that's why I use that experience to design the SQL debugging experience. It's super easy. First, of course, everybody loves uh, console log, so you know you can place just use console log in any kind of in any any part of the contract. Okay, you can just it, because it's just TypeScript, right? JavaScript. So you can place console log to print out any value you can you can want uh, you want right native support console log okay so if this is not enough and you want to watch exactly what happens and uh, step through it of course because as the system mentioned it is just TypeScript so you can just use uh, any of your type TypeScript uh, ID your favorite whatever it is for me here I show an example. I think the most popular TypeScript, uh, Visual Studio Code, okay? So because it's a TypeScript, you can just set the breakpoints, you can watch variables, you can look at the, you know, call stack, you can even use the console to, the debug console to evaluate some kind of uh, expressions. You can even look at the, all the variable values and track it. So basically it's just the TypeScript. So that makes it I think at least 100 times easier to debug any kind of like, let's say uh, Solidity code, right? Because Visual Studio code, when you download it, you don't have to install any kind of extension. It, it has TypeScript support natively, okay? So this makes the debugger superb. I think it's much, much easier and debugging much, much easier than any other computing blockchains. Okay, so if you've not tried out, definitely try this out. What the questions? Uh, sure. So let me to, to pin that on. Uh, the question is, what happens to Satoshis that are in the Hello World contract? Do they go to the color of the contract or is that an extra line of code? What happens to it? Uh, I think for that, let's go back, still goes back to the original you know, UTXO model. So when we deploy it, right, it's one transaction, right? And the contract is here and the Bitcoin is also here. So the output consists of two parts. One is a contract and the second part is the amount, okay? So let's say you deploy it with two Bitcoins in. And then someone uh, using the contract is a hello world example with you hash, let's say you hash in the number 42, okay? The hash of 42 is here. So when you come here, you use the number 42, you spend these two coins. So when, when you run it, when the miners check it, it's going to, hey, this, this hash matches. So it says, okay, this transaction can move the coins here. So after you can unlock it, it's like, hey, I'm verified. This one is the legitimate spender. And then you're asking, hey, where does the Bitcoin go next, right? So because this one can spend it, so this Bitcoin can go to the output in the next transaction. You know, this is a deployment transaction. This is spending transaction. So the Bitcoins go from here to the output here, right? But here, I only show one output, but it can be up, you know, absolutely many, right? You can be two, you can do be a thousand. So it all depends, you know, whoever, you know, unlocks this, decide where the Bitcoins to go, right? Can go to, go to his own address. It can go to, you know, Bob and Charlie's address. You can go to another contract. Yeah, it's all up to whoever, you know, unlocks it. Does this make sense? Have we responded to you, El Torito? Yeah, I think I'm going to keep going and uh, if it says, no, I can always come back. Yeah, okay. of course. Sure. Okay. Yeah, because ahead. it's text. Okay. All right. So I just talk about how do you test, how do you deploy, how do you call, and also how do you, uh, very importantly, how do you debug SQL contract? Another thing is how do I manage it? Different versions, right? For example, you know, not only I have, uh, you know, I've write my own contract. I want to, you know, share it with Word or I have a big, big project, right? I have many dependencies, right? Let's say I have a main contract and then it's going to depend on 
library one, two, three, four, right? And they're all maybe from different parties and they may even change versions from one thing web, right? That's all the big project is about, you know, we need some kind of package manager, right? So here, as I talked in the very beginning, when we design it, we design it such a way it's compatible with all your favorite tools. So for example, here, because it, it's just TypeScript, you can just use NPM, the Node Package Manager. You, we don't have Ascript Package Manager here, right? You can just reuse NPM, right? I just show some example here. You know, this is a library you write. You can just, hey, I want to, you know, publish to NPM with uh, NPM publish. And then when you want to import it, you just NPM install. So here, this is a library called uh, Robin Verifier. Basically, it's related to Oracle, but we don't have to know data. Basically, you can publish this and anybody who wants to use it, they can just say, hey, NPM install. And once they installed, they can just treat this as a local package and then they just reuse it in their own contract. As easy as that, as any other, as I said, again, 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 it's just the TypeScript. So you can use all your favorite developer tools like IDE, package management, of them, you don't have to learn any new tools, okay? So hopefully this will give you a very high level understanding of uh, the whole workflow looks like. And uh, uh, we make it as simple as, as possible. So then the next big question is, hey, you just tell me uh, it looks looks great, but what kind of things have people been building you since? So that in the next, I think the next half of my presentation, I'm going to cover that. So what kind of, you know, smart contract have people be, be people build or are building that uh, so I can learn from them. And also I want to get a sense, is there like a limitation to what kind of contracts I can, I can build on using these tools, okay? So the first big category, you know, we uh, introduced and some other people program have using Ascript is uh, so-called outsource computation. So what does it mean? You know, I, I have a very exa simple example here. Let's say, you know, Alice, you know, he's a Sudoku fan. She's solving some Sudoku puzzle today, but then she couldn't figure it out. So, so she just says, announce to the world. Hey, anybody, is anybody out there who can solve my Sudoku? puzzle, and then I'm going to pay you one Bitcoin, okay? So usually in the real world, right, you have this so-called fail exchange problem. If Alice, if Bob comes here to, and says to, uh, to Alice, hey, I have the question, I have the solution to your Sudoku puzzle. But if Bob tells Alice first, Alice may not pay Bob, right? Vice versa, if Bob, if Alice pays Bob first, and then Bob may just, you know, run away without telling her the solution, right? So this is a very good way to use a smart contract, especially a Bitcoin smart contract, because, you know, Alice can just program it, put this one Bitcoin into, into a contract, and the contract is also very simple. The contract just says, hey, you can unlock me, you can spend the coins in it, if and only if the solutions you provide matches my puzzle. It is a real legitimate solution, okay, to my Sudoku puzzle, okay? The, in this way, you know, Bitcoin is almost like a, you know, incorruptible judge, right? So once you lock this in a contract and Bob can just put the solution in and take the money and because he has to reveal the solution on chain and Alice guaranteed to, to get it, okay? So this is just a toy example. You know, you can go to a fancier uh, type of computation because this can be arbitrary computation, right? For example, you may want to be, hey, well, I want, I'm a logistic company. I want to find, uh, you know, the shortest route to traverse all my, you know, the homes I'm going to deliver, right? So this is also practical. So you can say, hey, I, I don't want to solve it myself. I want to outsource it, right? So you can place some kind of bounties on Bitcoin and uh, whoever can solve it gets paid, right? The, the, the benefit is it's trustless, right? The buyer doesn't have to trust and the seller doesn't have to trust the buyer, okay? So you can even you use it to build, you know, we, we probably some examples, you build 
for people who have been in the machine learning world, you probably heard about this site called it, or this computation competition called Kaggle. So basically, the machine learning competition, whoever can get the best model uh, using the training data, they can get a big rewards. You know, sometimes up to one million dollars. So this is really so big. So you, with this kind of tools, our tools, you can actually build Kaggle, but it's, it's like a decentralized version on Bitcoin. And what's the benefit? Why is transparent, right? You know, you can see all the terms, conditions, and nobody can cheat. The second is, you know, also is because our fees is a fraction of a fraction of a cent. So you can host any, a very low amount, you know, uh, competition. You don't have to offer, always offer one million dollars or even one hundred thousand dollars. You can have, let's say, 10, 10 cents, right? Or even for Sudoku, it can be low as, as one cent, right? So you can, it just opens up a new decentralized machine learning marketplace, which I'm very uh, interested, in, especially in the age of, you know, the open API, chat GPT, now it's getting a lot of more momentum, okay? So this is big, first big category, we have uh, Pioneer League. So maybe it's a, a little bit different from, you know, a lot of other blockchains, which is kind of like uh, tokens, you know, ICO and uh, DeFi type of uh, apps. So we, we look mostly look at, uh, I think it's more, I, I think it's more uh, utility type of uh, smart contract that we want our users to build. But of course, it's just a tool. So if you want to build that kind of tools, also also people have used our script to build all kinds of tokens, you know, even DeFi on top of Bitcoin, okay? So the next thing I'm also very interested about is, uh, and also where we have developed is so-called uh, incomplete information games. So for people, you know, in other, you know, in a childhood, you probably play this game called uh, Battleship. So basically the blockchain, especially smart contract is very good at, you know, trying to enforce conditions on logic on chain but it has a little bit of a slight problem because you have to publish the code on chain, the everything see it, right? And all the, not only your state, not only your logic, but also your data. So that brings a problem. If you want to bring uh, any kind of game that's not so-called complete information. For example, you can play chess, right? Alice and Bob, they can play chess on chain, no problem because you know, even in an off-chain chess, you know, you know my moves, I know your moves, that's no problem. But what if they want to play poker on chain using script or any kind of a other blockchains or programming languages or tools? It's very, you know, at first glance, it's impossible, right? Because if they put this on a smart contract, you know, Alice can know Bob's cars and they know what's, what's it, what are the cards under the deck, on the deck, okay? Which is not good, right? <laughs> Obviously. So with this kind of new tools, we provided, you know, so-called zero knowledge proof. So zero knowledge proof on the highest level is you're proving you know some secret without disclosing the secret, okay? So we apply to, you know, it can be used in all kinds of different scenarios, but here in this big category, we just apply it to games as you can know, only know partial information. For example, you know, poker, I just talked about, but also battleship, you know, battleship, if you are playing when you're a kid, you know, you know, Alice and Bob, they sit next, uh, opposite to each other, they cannot see the position of the, the opponent's fleet, right? So using zero knowledge in the, you know, contract, you know, we put this contract on chain, but we don't, directly put the information on chain. We just provide, we just put, let's say the hash, right? You may do some other compression, but in this case, we put a hash of the fleet position on chain. So is it committed on chain? Nobody can cheat, but at the same time, we're using zero knowledge proof. Within S script, we have S script libraries that can do zero knowledge proof. So you make sure nobody's Let's say after the placement, nobody's moving a shift or 
if it is a fire, if the, the other uh, opponent is guessing a position and is a hit, you know, you have to admit is a hit. I said, that's no, you cannot cheat. At the same time, you guarantee your privacy of your fleet, right? Otherwise, this kind of games, they cannot be played, okay? So this is a simple, you know, two players, but also you can even do like, you can think of, you know, all the most popular games, right? You know, uh, World of Warcraft or Civilization, all kind of this game is a strategy game because you don't know everything all the time. That's what it makes it fun, right? So here we also have shown another example, you know, this Dark Forest originally launched on Bitcoin, oh no, sorry, Ethereum. So basically you have different planets and uh, different planets, you can get a resource and then you can build an army and, and you can send out a spaceship to conquer other planets. Okay, so uh, obviously this is also a partial information game. So in, you know, because we have zero knowledge, they also use in zero knowledge, but the problem is the fees is too high. And also whenever there's a, I would say hundreds of developers want, hundreds of users want to play with it same time, then the whole thing just, uh, it almost slows down to something that cannot be played at all because we are more scalable. So, you know, here, and also we have the primitive of zero notch. So you can actually, this game, if you really want to play it on chain, it actually works better today on Bitcoin SV, okay? So this is just one example of zero knowledge proof. We use it in games, as I said before. You can also think of zero knowledge using for all, a lot of other cases. You know, for example, when you go to a bar, you don't want to show your exact age, or you want, don't want to show the some kind of ID which has all your other data because the the bar just want to make sure you're above a certain uh, legal age. That's it. So you can even use you know this similar type of algorithm to prove you're above the age, but you don't have to have any other information out there. Okay, this is just another type. So we also list all the, a lot of use, uh, other use cases of zero knowledge you can explore in our blogs, okay? So the, the next thing I want to also hint about is the so-called, you know, AI and machine learning because recently you know, it's getting a lot of uh, hype, you know, especially from the chat GPT world. So here we also have libraries that programs so-called here I give an example of uh, deep learning. So for people who are not familiar with this, basically this is like a handwritten digit recognition machine learning algorithm. Okay. So you have, uh, let's say three layers of, uh, you know, uh, input layer, the output layer, and also the uh, hidden layer. But we also program the whole thing completely. This is whole thing is running completely on chain. You can also add many layers because we are scalable and cheap. So you can actually run machine learning prediction on, on, on chain directly. So we also have examples. So to combine it with, you know, you know, this is blockchain meets AI and machine learning. So we have a lot of primitives, perceptrons, neural nets, deep learning. And also we also combine with zero knowledge. For example, here you can hide your inputs, right? For example, this input can be your personal biometric data, right? The fingerprints or your age or your health data. You don't want to reveal it. You can combine with zero knowledge and run on chain. People know it's transparent. This is really you. And this is the, the prediction you get. But at the same time, without disclosing your private or sensitive data, or if your company on this model, you want to say, hey, I'm fair. I'm applying, let's say credit card model on all on all applicants fairly. So you can put, you know, you can using zero knowledge combined with machine learning, you can also hide the, your proprietary model, but you, in that way you can guarantee everybody can make sure it's sure because it's running on chain, you can prove everybody being treated equally, okay, and get the fair credit card score, for instance. Okay. So this is also a super big category and we provided uh, quite a few realistic examples and uh, we are excited to see how you can extend, okay? So this is uh, just a few types of cases. I think it's uh, quite different from 
you know, many other blockchains, which is kind of like a DeFi type of feel. And this is more interdisciplinary disciplinary, and also more, I think, uh, offers more real world utility rather than just, uh, you know, a lot of time is speculation. So this, I just showed, you know, what kind of big categories, of course, you can, for more examples, you can explore our blog on our official website. I'm going to put uh, later on. So this is uh, another, so from here on, you know, I have about, you know, let's say half an hour. So I want to plug in, you know, so this is applications, but also I want to make sure another big type of application I've been, uh, for smart card I've been working on is to show, hey, you probably don't need a lot of other blockchains because, you know, because it's a fully programmable and has this smart contract capability, you can actually implement a lot of other blockchains, you know, but on top of Bitcoin as we, without, you know, break any kind of a, you know, hard fork or breaking changes, okay? For example, you know, you probably heard about the, if you know about a big BTC, you probably heard about this big upgrade, which is, you know, held as the, the biggest upgrade since, you know, let's say uh, SegWit, right, called Taproot. So basically you don't, yeah, here, you don't have to know uh, all the detail, but uh, if you look at this diagram, basically I want to show, it's, uh, it's a tremendous undertaking. It's, uh, it takes about four years and uh, hundreds of developers have to contribute from to ship from the idea, which is about, uh, you know, end of and the beginning of 2018 till when it's emerged, that's, that's the type of efforts you have to spend, you know, to ship Taproot in the BDC network, okay? What about if you do it, you know, using our tools, but, but you program this thing on top of a Bitcoin SV. Actually, I did this, you know, in an, just like a coffee break about, I think 10 to 30 minutes. I can just code this whole thing. It's a, even counting all the empty lines, it's less than 30, 30 lines. You can actually code the whole taproot thing within, with just one developer, if you're already familiar with S-Script and in about less than half an hour. Okay, so from four years of hundreds of developers to just a, a solo developer, just pretty much a coffee break, okay? So that just give you a sense of, what kind of a you know productivity gain you can have by by knowing this kind of smart contract is if extremely powerful. I think here if you do the man hours comparison, it's about one million times more efficient, right? So that's hopefully give you some sense why we are very excited about S script and why it's a good idea for you to learn about it. Okay. Especially in the early stage that you can have a you can develop all kinds of seemingly impossible things on top of Bitcoin without, you know, changing anything under the hood, right? Which is very controversial and also time consuming. So just to make this even better, so BDC network, they also pro propose the next, you know, upgrade, you know, after Taproot, it's got graph root. The thing about it is uh, another, almost think about improvement, improved version of Taproot. But the good thing is, again, you probably have, you can guess it. So we can already program this on top of Bitcoin SV and we can ship it today. And it also, it's also uh, just uh, tens of lines. You don't have to, I think it's still, they are still going to yet to be delivered maybe in a few years and after spending hundreds of developers years. So actually you can code this and ship it today. Okay, so that's another example of the productivity gain you can use by knowing S script and uh, uh, what other computing blockchains are doing. Okay, well, so another big, go ahead. From me, uh, so from my point of view, the, the difference is huge, right? So where did the difference come from? Because when I see that you can program it in 20 minutes 
uh, versus the hundreds or uh, even maybe thousands of hours uh, from other people. What's what's the what's the like uh, hands-on difference? You know, it's like the programming language difference, or of, of from where this comes from. The, okay. the Excellent why, question. why is why is why is working on on BTC so time consuming? Let's say. Okay. Excellent question. So the the biggest fundamental difference is on BTC. If you have any kind of new features you want to introduce, you you do it in so called uh, using hard fork by introducing new opcode. Okay. So you are not. Uh, using existing opcode to program it. So that, which is the Bitcoin SV approach. Bitcoin SV approach is, hey, you have this uh, virtual machine building. When you have new application scenarios, let's say Taproot, you don't change the underlying you know, protocol or add a new opcode. It's like uh, analogy is, hey, you got this new computer with a CPU, which is already so-called Turing complete, right? So one way in Bitcoin SV way is, if you have a, a new application, you just program this using software, right? Because you get all the instructions you need. Sometimes you may have to think about new ways to do something, let's say zero knowledge, right? It's not straightforward. You have to you have to code it by right, yourself. But versus BTC is an analogy is hey, every time I you know you got a new computer and with a CPU, you want to add some new features, you're asking Hey, uh, Intel or you know a, a ARM, can you just add some new instructions to the CPU? So in the next, when you ship the next CPU, maybe in two years, I can have this feature. That's what exactly what the BTC people are doing. So every time they want to do something new, let's say tab root or you know graph root, or you probably heard about this thing, you know Schnorr signature, right? So they are saying, hey, I need some new opcode. I need to change the protocol. So then that involves a lot of controversy and testing back and forth. That it is mostly, uh, I think, as a phil philosophy, uh, it's different uh, philosophy. For them, when you do new things, you have to change the protocol by adding new opcode. It's like a change the CPU instruction set, right? We know about hardware iteration. It's not as, fast as just program some software right? it takes forever right but for us the philosophy is always hey you already have these tools this uh, virtual machines you don't have to change it to do a lot of, a lot of time it's just innovation um, of course right if you want to let's say uh, introduce taproot or Schnorr signature into BTC you know, you may seem it's easier to just add some new opcode or change the protocol so you can do it natively, right? The developers, they don't have worry. It's just a protocol developers, protocol layer core developers. They have done, they have to do it. But the problem is, you know, it's a blockchain context, right? Every time you introduce breaking changes, it's going to take almost forever and it may not even ship and you, it's going to be controversial. For us, it's always, hey, don't change the underlying protocol. Actually, it's turning complete, so you can just use our tools, you know, just program it. This is Schnorr signature, right? So they have another beep that's uh, introducing at the same time with a taproot upgrade. But again, it also takes many years and for us, it's, again, as you can tell, they can probably code it uh, in an afternoon. Or if you're really good at maybe another 30 minutes, okay? So versus three years or even four years. So that's a fundamental difference of our approach. Okay, thank you. That's that's clearer now. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah, excellent question. I think this is a boils down to the fundamental, I think, uh, philosophy we have on Bitcoin SV is, hey, we already have the, you know, it's almost like we have the CPU. Whenever we have some kind of new application, don't, we don't have, we don't go back and ask the hardware manufacturer in this case, the protocol developers to change the hardware because that takes forever as controversial. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not a good approach. For us, we always try to say, hey, is this alternative? Is that go around? I can just program, I can just code this thing, you know, using S script. 
and uh, usually is uh, is is possible. I would say I would even say it's always possible. Okay, because it's Turing complete. So if I've not given you enough example, I can just give you tap root, the graph root, this Schnorr signature. You know, it's just an alternative signature scheme versus the native one we use, so-called ECDSA. And uh, there's another one even saying, hey, this is called uh, CheckSeq from Stack. They are also proposing to add this new opcode into the BDC network. Or in the BCH, they call it the DataSeq Verify. Again, you probably know the history here. Uh, you actually don't need the breaking changes. You can just code this and implement using existing opcodes or instruction sets from the Bitcoin virtual machine, okay? Again, probably take you half an hour or one hour, depending on how familiar with it, you are familiar with. It. So I just talked about the Bitcoin, a different variants of Bitcoin protocol. And uh, let's look at some of the other completely independent blockchains. You know, Zcash. So for people, you know, who is more so-called privacy or I, I call it the anonymity, anonymity uh, focus. So Zcash is, a, you know, pioneers the usage of zero knowledge proof in blockchain space by so-called, uh, you know, a specific type of zero knowledge proof called the ZK Snarks. So here we don't have to get into the detail what is, uh, you know, ZK Snark, but basically you can think of it as one way to implement zero knowledge proof on blockchain is very amenable to blockchain because why is very lightweighted. The proof size is small and also verification is also very, uh, you can do it on Bitcoin. No, no, sorry, uh, blockchain because it's uh, easy to verify, right? Because blockchain is not very good at heavy computation and large proof size, okay? So this is very blockchain friendly and also it's so-called non, so N, stands for non-interactive. So basically it means uh, when you publish it and when, uh, when the verify checks it, it doesn't have to talk to the prover because this is what happens in blockchain, right? So once you deploy a contract, you just, a lot of time you can go away or you may not always be online. So the prover, the verify doesn't always can talk to you. Okay, so the bottom line is very, uh, suitable for blockchain use case and they're the first one to pilot, pilot, which is very cool. But again, as you probably have guessed, you can also, because we already implemented zero knowledge proof in our libraries, you can also, you can pretty much implement Zcash on top of Bitcoin SV, okay? So that's the, that's the part. You don't need another, launch another blockchain. So you can you enjoy all the, security benefit or the networking effect of Bitcoin. You don't you don't need to launch another blockchain to do it, okay? And also, because Zcash, you can only do Z, ZK Snark, is, uh, is, you can think about it as hard-coded, right? And there's no, you cannot program it. Versus Bitcoin, not only you can program Zcash, but also you can program pretty much anything, you know, in, on top of it. And if you don't like other people's Zcash, uh, smart counter, you can program your own Zcash, you know, using all kinds of other zero knowledge proof. That's also possible, only possible on Bitcoin SV today. And uh, this, so this is Zcash. Another big example, I always, uh, you know, one of my favorite, it's called ZK Rollup, but you can do it on Bitcoin, actually. So this word is uh, usually, I think, associated either with Ethereum or EVM compatible chains. Basically it's a way to so-called to scale the blockchain using layer two approach. So roll up, you know, some people may heard about the opportunistic roll up, but here I'm focusing on the ZK roll up type of flavor of roll up. So the basic idea is also very simple. It also use that so-called zero knowledge proof technology. So the basic idea as almost the name suggests, that let's say you have 1000 transactions you know, the naive, naive way would be sending all these transactions to the miners or, you know, uh, validator, whatever you call it, and they have to check everything one by one, right? So what if you can roll them up, right? It's like you almost have a paper, you roll all of them up, and then you just send in one transaction, and this transaction has a proof. This proof says, if you, this proof, this proof is, 
hey, all these 1,000 transactions, they are valid, okay? So the, this one single transaction, then they can be broadcast to the network, to the mining network. And if the miners verify this proof, this single proof, and this single transaction is good, then they, they can be sure all these 1,000 original raw transactions, they are valid, okay? So in this case, right? So you can see why it uh, helps with scalability, right? Because instead of processing 1,000 transactions, or even 1 million or even 1 billion transactions, you are actually just validating one transaction, right? So that can, you know, indirectly helps with the scalability. And so probably you have so, guessed what, what, where I'm going question, with this. Question, question from me again. Uh, so if you, if you like, let's say stack the transactions and you uh, make it into the one transaction, so you actually pay fees for one transaction or you need to pay a fee for every transaction that is stacked as well? Okay, yeah, a very good question. So in, in, in this specific example, right? So you need to all this, actually now instead of paying, I think uh, you have two, two parts of fees here. One is, hey, first you send all this to some kind of like a coordinator or some people call it a, you know aggregator. They have to aggregate all this and can produce a proof, right? So that's the first layer of fees. You know, if an end user, you're not sending directly to blockchain, they have to, you have to pay this coordinator to uh, for some fees, right? And then once the coordinator aggregate all this, they send to the blockchain, and then this they have to charge the mining fee. Okay. So the idea, hopefully, I think is with zero knowledge. The idea is, as I said earlier the verification is going to be very lightweight. So this part is going to be, uh, the, this one transaction fee, I think it's, a li I think it's slightly bigger than the regular uh, smart contract fees because it's doing zero knowledge, which is very lightweight. So this is reasonable, but the problem is here is as long as it's lower than 1000, right? It's much easier. It's actually much lower than 1000, right? So compared to the alternative, you to pay one thousand. So this fee, verifying the, the single aggregated transaction is much, much lower than 1000 transaction fees from all these transactions, okay? So that's why from end user, you actually got decreased transaction fee. Does this make sense? Yeah, that makes make sense, of course. Thanks. Okay, okay, great, great question. Any other question from the audience? Yeah, don't be shy. You can post your question on the chat. Yeah, anytime. Yeah, keep the questions coming. Okay. So uh, while we're wait waiting for some questions, so again, you probably have a guess, right? Because the ZK ROP is based on zero knowledge proof technology. And I said zero knowledge proof, we already implement uh, as a library in s -Cube. So you can also produce the same thing, so-called layer two scaling using ZK Rob on top of Bitcoin actually. And because our base layer fee is much cheaper, right? As I showed in the very uh, first two slides, it's like usually it's 10,000 or sometimes 100,000 times cheaper. So actually this ZK Rob actually works great. It works much better on Bitcoin SP than let's say Ethereum, because this is for Ethereum, this is the number one scaling solution today. And this, the funny thing is, this ZK Rob actually works at least 10,000 or sometimes 100,000 uh, or even 1 million times better, I mean cheaper on Bitcoin. And you can use the same technology. Okay. So we talk about uh, two, you know, solid, uh, one is, uh, you know, Zcash, and the other is, you know, let's say Ethereum or EVM compatible chains. We can implement the best features actually on Bitcoin using Ascript today. We don't have to wait a long time to for you to to be adopted on the mainnet. So the next thing I just you know kind of the final example I want to give is a so-called Monero. So for people who have heard about Zcash, you probably heard about also heard about Monero, but it is using a different technology to let's say hide information you know on, on chain. So it's called a ring signature. Basically it's a type of a signature scheme, you know, almost as the name suggests. So usually when you have one sig one public key, right? 
uh, you can only have the owner of the private key to generate a valid signature against the public key. But in the ring signature scheme, let's say Alice wants to sign, but they have a they have a group. It's almost like you're hiding a, in a crowd. Okay, so let's say you have eleven people here. Any of them sign, then when you have the signature, you validate it against the so-called group key, group public key. It's all going to be valid. Okay, so instead of one to one correspondence, here you have you have uh, like let's say eleven possibilities, right? Because any of these people in this group, you know, if you look at a, uh, it's almost a standing in a ring. Any of this one can sign, and the signature is going to be valid. So in this way, you are like, uh, obfuscate, yeah, your identity, right? So people look at on chain, they only see the signature versus some kind of like a ring public key or like group public key. They don't know exactly which member. They cannot tell which one of these eleven people signed. Okay. So again, again, you probably have guessed. Uh, so you don't need to, we can actually implement ring signature on top of Bitcoin SV because it's fully programmable. So using S script. So this is similar code we have seen before. You, you can actually implement this uh, probably maybe in the afternoon if really good and you can have fully tested, you can deploy, you can even try it. So you can build actually Monero also on top of Bitcoin. You don't have to you know, so you can use the same security of a proof of work. You don't have to, and also because the uses more, you can even hide it better. So, ironically, ironically, you can even run Monero. Not only possible, but I would argue it's also better if you can just do it on Bitcoin. Okay. So that's uh, you know, as this uh, concludes my talk, and I'm really glad that you guys are tuned in and uh, you know want to know more about us, I hope some of you are, uh, go to sql.io. We have all the uh, tutorials, tools, and APIs, SDKs, and we'll also, if you have any question, you know, you can go to our Discord, Slack, Twitter, we have all the support. And also we publish regularly, I think it's most, almost weekly on our new blog, on showing what kind of contracts people can build. You know, it's all kind of a very interesting use cases you can definitely subscribe to. And uh, yeah, I'm going to close here. And uh, any remaining, any other questions, you can just feel free to submit them now. Thank you. Thank you, Shankwe. Uh, yeah, of course, you can post your questions. Uh, we have still still time. We are over one hour, but mm -hmm. yeah. If you if you want to ask anything, you can you can post any comments. Uh, of course, you can reach us on our social media, uh, LinkedIn, or I think in the description we have uh, all the links. So uh, you can just go to the description of the YouTube uh, video. Um, I don't see more questions. I see just thank you. Yeah, one question. Let's let's put that on the on the screen so we can see it. From Jakub. Um. A little bit deeper into a script, considering stateful contracts, how to terminate the contract and pay someone at the end without propagating the state anymore? Oh, excellent question. Uh, I think, I, yeah. Okay, I even got a backup slide for this. Okay. So yeah, excellent question. So the, the the question regarding here is, you know, Bitcoin smart contract, if you look at the UTXO model, right? So if we only have the UTXO model, if it looks, it seems the Bitcoin smart contract is lacking some capability, meaning it cannot maintain state, right? Because, so let's say every time you have some state, no, sorry, some smart contract here, 
once you spend it, right? It's like UTXO. It can only be, it will be destroyed. This UTXO is gone, right? So that means if you have any kind of internal state, this one is already gone, right? So that's how you, you by default, every contract it, it will be, you know, terminated after it has been called one single time, okay? But that's not always the contract you want, right? For example, you want some kind of like a voting contract or you want to some kind of like a gaming contract, right? It has the internal state. Then you have, I just showed you the, for example, the battleship one, right? You may just have the first move, the opponent is going to about to start his first move, first, first guess. You want to do the game to, to continue, right? To run, it's not terminated yet. So for that, and uh, we have some, so for people who have heard about a functional, so here Bitcoin is uh, pretty much like a functional thing. So you have the function, right? And you have the witness that to evaluate too. For functional, you can always simulate so-called uh, states. A functional is usually called stateless and pure, but you can also simulate state. But all we, you don't have to know the data, but the general idea is, hey, instead of, uh, let's say here, output, you, you put the state in output too, but when you spend it, you have to, the, the contract also have to make sure the state propagates to the next transaction. Okay, so basically here, the code smart counter here at the state. And when you spend it, usually you don't care about the output, right? But we have a way in, you know, in s we also build some abstraction saying in the smart counter, you also make sure the state trans transition is following the, the rules. Okay, so for example here, if you spend from state zero, you, you can go to state one and rise you know, et cetera, you can from state one, you can go to state two. So in this way, through a chain of transactions, you can also simulate states. So is it, it, you gain the same kind of uh, uh, abstraction as almost if this is a, a state machine as a EVM it is, okay? Does this answer the question? So basically is by default, it's a stateless every time you, you spend a you call a contract, it terminates. But there, you, we also have abstractions so that when you use our, you know, it's got a stateful property, basically it means, you know, if you go to the very beginning, our slides, uh, let me see, I can even show, show one example, stage, uh, state, so that's a way you can declare your, your see here. Oh, here, this example. So here, this is the state for example, I just showed this is how to write. Basically when you define the property, you can, you can say whether this is a part of the state. You can say, hey, by default it's force, that means you know, it's not going to be updated on chain once it's deployed, but you can also say it's stateful. So let's say this is a super simple counter example. So basically when you deploy the counter is zero and the only way you can spend it is to keep the counter next counter to, to one and then two and uh, so on, so forth. Okay, so this is how you code a stateful counter. Basically declare this property to be True, meaning it's part of the state. And then we use some schemes to, so in this blob of code, I think for more, you can read out the, the documentation, but this blob of code, make sure the state also propagates and increment it as expected. Okay. Yeah, excellent question. I think this is something a lot of people asked in the beginning. You know, if you only use it UTXO, can you do state? But the, the question, the answer is absolutely yes. And also it's also simple here as we showed here. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Jakub. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? We still have time. Mm -hmm. 
How about you? Do you have any other questions? Uh, no, I think you responded to all my questions during the <laughs> this session. Okay, okay. Is this uh, something I would say is a little bit different, let's say, at least to, from what you expected? Or is this something you have heard of similar kind of contract before? Or this is very new, the concept, uh, UTXO-based uh, uh, Bitcoin. Yeah, I think it's contract. quite different from our, it's quite different from our previous Yes. One. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I think it's it was interesting. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, of course, not for someone who's uh, starting with the let's say whole blockchain technology or even a programmer. So this is like maybe uh, once you know all the basic concepts, so you could take more from from this right because uh, anything we we have seen here might be quite cryptic if you don't have any any programming experience or you don't know uh, let's say the basic concept of the how the blockchain uh, or btc works uh, but i hope in general people took um, um, something from it and by something i mean you know really really deep deep knowledge of 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 what you're doing i didn't ask you before but uh i could check it on on linkedin but how 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 many years do you have of experience working on on this script oh for me i've been working on this since uh 2018. 2018. so it's been a quite a long journey and uh just you know since you're asking uh, <laughs> So before we have this, uh, we had this developer tool. Basically, is a Ascript uh, extension on the marketplace of Visual Studio Code. So this is our growth since we launched. We formally launched uh, in twenty twenty three. So this is the growth we have seen. I think I don't today. It's probably like five thousand. So yeah, it's already uh, five thousand people are, are using it. So if you want to give it a try, you are not a you're not alone. And we have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, very active community on GitHub, on all kinds of Discord. You can always, if you have any questions, we want to, we, you, you have an answer. Probably less than two hours, okay? <laughs> so we are very active. We are the biggest developer community in Bitcoin S3, actually. Great, great, great. Of course, it's and, uh, also depending on your, uh, maybe, where you where you from? Because you're located on uh, the west coast, right, of the U.S. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And do you have uh, developers all over the world, or is mostly in in U.S.? I think it's uh, most of them is not in U.S. As far as I can tell, I think it's uh, uh, I think almost like a, a third, a third. I, I think one third is in Asia. That's from my guess, and uh, it's probably more than one third in, in Europe because the Bitcoin SV has a big ecosystem around uh, Europe. You know, actually we have a big conference, annual conference in London at the end of this uh, month. I think a thousand people will go to London. So we have a big presence in the UK. And also after that, we have a event in Berlin. That's also a big meetup. So it's, uh, Europe is actually big for us. And also, you know, Poland because the Marcin, I don't know, that's your colleague or some, yeah, he's also a big proponent of uh, Bitcoin SV and also Ascript. So actually he introduced me to this great event. So that's why I want to, yeah. Yeah, also not only you have uh, online support, but also we got a very uh, big uh, active community also in Europe as well. Great, great, good to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just okay. coming back to your comment, I think this is for something, yeah, you feel this is something for, for people who have, have quite blocking understanding. So we are actually trying to do the, you know, try to get the barrier to as low as possible. You know, that's why when we first designed this, we have our, this line is, uh, we have previous version with few iterations basically. And the first we have this, Ascript is its own language, is uh, similar to Solidity. So the problem is, as I showed in the graph, right? 
even with 5,000 users, but compared to JavaScript, that's like 20 million. So that's why later on we kind of like upgraded to so-called this script, you know, TypeScript based script. So more people, you know, instantly all the web tool developers, they can know it immediately without knowing any different language or different tools, right? And also where we make all these abstractions, for example, how you deploy, how you call, it's all, you know, under the hood is sophisticated, but we make it abstract in a way such that, you know, even if you don't know anything about Bitcoin or blockchain in general, you can pretty much treat it as a, like, it's almost like a database. You can read and write from it and also uh, call its functions, but you don't have to touch from, from our perspective, for our users, if you use our tools, you don't have to know anything specific about Bitcoin. You are almost treating it or blockchain. You are treating it almost like, a, let's say, a Web2 database. So that's our objective. We, so we are constantly iterating and get feedback from developers. And so we can make it as easy as Web2 developer uh, develop, development experience. Okay. So that's just our uh, our focus right now. Yeah. Great, great, great. Uh, so once again, thank you, Shang Kui. Uh, that was a good talk. Hope every everyone liked it. And okay. yeah, thank you, maybe, Adam. Maybe see you. Maybe see you in Europe once you. <laughs> yeah, I'll be there. Yeah, I'll be, yeah, I'll be in Europe at end of the month. Yeah, UK and then Germany. Yeah, maybe you can come up to our London conference, or you can at, maybe you can come to our Berlin meetup. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, Berlin, Berlin would be uh, way way closer to, or maybe even London would be easier with the flight. But yeah, we'll see. <laughs> okay, uh, all right. Look once again, th right. thank you, thank you, everyone. Have a thank good you. rest of the evening. And all right, you too. Hopefully, see okay. you soon on the next one. See you around. Okay. All right. I'll be okay. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.